This is the, uh, this is what I'm going to talk about part of it anyway. Bunky, I don't remember why we named the dog Bunky. He's earned two air medals, real life air medals, uh, in combat and flight. He's also received a Purple Heart. And we'd like to get him transported back to the United States. And Pan American said, we'll fly Major Gunn anywhere in the United States where you can find somebody to pick him up. And my crew chief, Steve Zaletsky, said, I'll do it. And they flew him to Detroit. Steve picked him up. And Bunky ended his days in Detroit. He's a couple of our other crew chiefs who went in to visit him after we got back. And they were getting ready to fire. They had lock and load, and they had 50 rounds that they were going to shoot. And as they were just preparing for, to fire, the uh, sergeant I had up in the tower with me said, sir, there's something moving out on the range. And sure enough, I looked over there, coming up from the, up in the bottom, there was a little puppy bouncing across the ground. It's like, oh, geez. So it's like, all right, <clears throat> stop, you know, stop what you're doing, unload the weapons, everybody get away from the firing line. And I told the sergeant, I said, go out there and get that dog or chase him out of there, do whatever you need to do. So he went down, took a Jeep down there and encountered the dog. And the dog wouldn't leave. Wouldn't leave. He just said, no, this is where I belong. So uh, he picked him up and brought him up to the, uh, to the uh, firing line with me. And uh, we continued to, to qualify. But the enlisted men decided that they would take him as our mascot. And that's where he got the name Bunky. So he became part of the gun platoon of our unit. But his next move was out to the West Coast, because we had to go to San Francisco to move this outfit over to Vietnam, and we all got on board the USS John Pope. This was a World War II troop ship that they were still using during this time. So we were going to get this dog on board a Navy ship and, and take him to Vietnam. A little bit of a little bit of history about Vietnam again, where it's at. You can see. Uh, Vietnam lives along the coastline here, and you got Laos, Thailand, Cambodia. And at that time, uh, there was a dividing line right about in here, and the North was fighting the South, and we were supporting the South. And this was also a time when we got to meet, we got to meet for the first time some of the ladies we would see throughout the war. We called them donut dollies, which sounds like a derogatory term, but it's not. Uh, it was a term that actually uh, developed in World War II and was carried over in Vietnam. These young ladies worked for the American Red Cross, and we saw them everywhere, everywhere. Battles didn't matter. In Vietnam, the worst place you can think of, and when these girls would suddenly show up smiling and, and be talking to the guys and just remind them of home. At any rate, our, our dog was having a lot of problems. He was not being cooperative. So one of the uh, young ladies came over and said, what's wrong with the dog? So, I don't know, he's maybe scared of a boat, I'm not sure what it was. She said, let me look at him. Apparently she was an affectionate of dogs. She said, I think I know the problem. If you will hold his mouth open. Yeah, all right. All right, so we held his mouth open. She reached in and found a loose tooth would be given a problem. Yanked that baby out. And then she took him, held him very close, and was petting him, and he just loved that. In fact, a couple of our guys were saying, ah, I love you. <laughs> Take my tooth out, too. At any rate, we got him on the ship without too much of a hassle and proceeded to head out. It was a very nice send-off. We had a Navy band out there. We had flags waving. We had people on the dock waving and saying goodbye and wishing us luck. And we sailed out underneath the uh, Golden Gate Bridge. And this was an interesting event because the uh, John Pope could carry about 5,000 troops. Well, we had three aviation companies on board, which was about 1,500. So we weren't crowded, but all 1,500 of us were on the deck as we were sailing out underneath the bridge. And it was deathly quiet. Couldn't hear a sound. And way up on the top, right up about, about the middle of the picture, as we're coming under the bridge, there was a young lady standing up there. I guess she was young, I don't know. <laughs> all I could see was a girl, and her skirt was blown in the wind, and she was up there with a, with a scarf, waving. Now, I don't know whether she knew somebody on the ship or what the deal was, but she was up there just waving back and forth. And this old sergeant, going back for a second tour of Vietnam, looked up and he said, boys, 
That's probably the last round-eyed lady you're going to see for a year. <laughs> and the place went absolutely crazy. Everybody was up and screaming and yelling and waving, and she could hear us. She actually heard the noise coming off that ship because she stopped, and you could see she was looking down at us like, what? <laughs> what's going on down there? And all these guys are up there screaming and yelling. We went under the bridge, and somehow she got from this side of the bridge to the other side of the bridge. And if you ever going to go Golden Gate, you can do that, but you're suicidal. And she got to the other side and was still waving as we went out of sight. So that was our real fun send-off. The trip over took 30 days, which was nice because that all counted against our tour. We had a one-year tour and we had to put in, and the first 30 days we're on a ship. Nobody's shooting. Good deal. Our first stop in Vietnam was up at Quinyon, which is sort of up on the northern edge of the Tucor area. I'll show you that set. And it was kind of auspicious as we're coming in on the ship, there's a body floating out. It's like, ooh, welcome to Vietnam. So we offloaded one of the aviation companies at Quinion. It was getting dark, so we spent the night. And what they did is they took us out to the middle of the bay and tied us up against another ship. And all night long, motorboats would be going around the ships, dropping hand grenades in the water to dissuade any frogman or anybody else who was trying to come out there and put a mine on the ship. It made it a little tough to sleep, but it was a good idea. At least we knew that we weren't going to get blown up by somebody. Early the next morning, we set sail again. And this is a kind of like a, a map of where we fought different battles throughout the, uh, the year that I was over there. But you can see Quinion up here in the, along the coastline. And we were going to sail from there down to our new home, which was down in Dongbatin. Looking at those core areas again, this was the uh, I Corps up here. That's where Bert used to hang out up there. Uh, this is two core. Went from here down to here. It was all the Central Highlands. It was mountains, and that's where I flew. Three core, four core. So the two core area was actually the largest area of all the cores over there. And our new home was Dong Batim, which was on a bay, Cameron Bay, as a matter of fact. And Cameron Bay was notable for a large Air Force base that was right there. And our compound was just across the bay from Cameron, right up there. This is where the heliport was, there's a runway over here, and some other elements right along Highway 1. Initially, when we set up, it was a 90-second assault helicopter company, and the uh, company name was Broncos, but somebody else had stolen the name before we got there. So they said, we got to do something else. Got to have a horse, because we already got a picture of a horse. So they said, OK, it's the stallions. All right, stallions, and then the guns became the sidekicks. So those were the uh, call signs for the company. Uh, topo map. You can see the uh, Don Batin area over here is the heliport. This is where our barracks were. The runway, here's the uh, main runway over at Cameron Bay. One of the old. Uh, Aerial photographs that they use for aviators. You see the helicopter parking area, main runway. This is what it looks like today. Of course, it's all been changed, deserted. This is where the helicopters park. This is where our quarters were. Runway over Dong Batan, Highway One, running up to the middle of it. If you look out towards the uh, towards the ocean, you can see it's pretty close. We got the bay and then South China Sea over there. You notice there's a lot of agriculture going on over here. Well, back in the day, that wasn't there. That was all jungle from the time you got, they cut all this way, but that was all jungle from there on out. Looking in the opposite direction, that was the main heliport that we got operated out of. They called it Flanders Field, a nod to our previous uh, fighters in World War I. Looking back to the west, we were at sea level, but we quickly got into the mountains. So that's why they call it the Central Highlands. And again, you can see there's a current uh, aerial or satellite photograph. You can see a lot of uh, agricultural going on there. But no, in 67, there was none of that. There's a radio relay station right in there. And right beyond that, the war started. We didn't own any of that property, and the bad guys lived out there. So uh, as soon as we got off the ground and started heading out, it was armed the weapons to be ready for, for action because we didn't own that property. Somebody else lived out there. 
These are basically our living quarters. Uh, we call them hooches. And the uh, enlisted men had a long hooch and they'd all had their own bunks. The officers had the hooches divided up into two men rooms. So we had a little bit of privacy. Uh, some bunkers built between each one because it wasn't unusual to get mortared or some other kind of incoming activity. And everybody would bail out head for the bunker. And this is where uh, Bunky made his home. Uh, he, felt, he felt right at home in the sand. And you notice uh, he wasn't a very big dog. When we got him, we thought he had big feet and a long nose and figured he's going to be a big dog. He turned out to be a small dog with big feet and a long nose. <laughs> Which wasn't a problem for us, but it was for Bunky because all the dogs in Vietnam are tall dogs. So as he grew older and became interested in other dogs, uh, it suddenly found out that what he was interested in was out of his reach. <laughs> but being the intelligent dog that he was, I watched him solve this problem one day. I came out of the hooch and Bucky was on the ground growling and throwing sand around, which was not unusual. We all did that occasionally. But he dug a trench. And he was disappeared and a little while later came back with one of his girlfriends who was pulling her by the ear. Right into the trench, which brought <laughs> you get the picture. You know, we got all her parts down to his level. And this was our happy group. And Bunky was right at the uh, right at the middle of the group. He uh, he was a gun dog. He knew the gun chips versus the slicks. And the reason he did is because the the helicopter made just a slightly different noise. We had a different rotor system on the gunships, and you could tell the difference in the sound. And he would sit in flight operations all day long and just lay around and drink some water and eat some food and not do a thing. Helicopters come in and go on all day long, and he would never move until he heard one of our helicopters from one of the gunships coming in. And then he'd be up barking and scratching at the door. They'd let him out. He'd run across the airfield, and he'd run around underneath the helicopter. Well, the problem there was that most of our helicopters were underpowered and overloaded, which means they didn't hover very well. So when you're trying to set it down in a revetment, you got this stupid dog running around underneath. It's like, don't kill a thing, don't watch out. Here's that shot again, and this pretty well defines uh, the two core area uh, from Doc Peck, which was right up against the uh, I Corps to the north, Play Coup, LZ X ray, sometimes you may have heard of that. Bammy to it in the Central Highlands down to Bowlock. And Bunky went to most of those places. He would travel regularly on the gunships and go with us. But uh, he spent a lot of time down here at Bowlock. Uh, about that time that we were over there, there was a lot of activity. This was after the Tet Offensive that they really started moving in down to the south. And we set up our forward position in Bowlock, which during the rainy season can be real. But uh, this is, we had two locations. We had our main base at Dogmatan and then our forward location out of Bowlock. And we supported the 173rd Airborne was out there. And they came in and plowed off an area and put in a uh, helipad for us, some rebutments for our gunship. And Monkey spent a lot of time there and he did really mind too much being up at Balaki as far as he was concerned, it was just another place. He'd ride on the gunships and he, he didn't mind flying in the aircraft. And there's two places he really liked to sit, was usually in the crew chief's lap or the gunner's lap. And he'd sit there with his head out the door and his ears would be flapping in the wind and he just loved that. But when things started happening, they'd take him and they'd set him on the ammo trays we had in the back and was loaded with ammunition. And he'd have to sit on that tray because that's what fed the miniguns. And then the door gunners would be working with their guns and we'd be firing rockets and miniguns. And he didn't like all that noise. He'd sit back there and howl. So I'm sure that everybody in the world heard what was going on because we had guns going off, we had rockets going off, and a dog howling in the middle of all this stuff. He just didn't like all the noise. We well, sat out of battle lock for quite a while. And then eventually he took a wound in the foot. Uh, we always said that he was the initiator of the, the old line, I'm here to find out who shot my paw. But we got to thinking about it, so you know what, he did not volunteer to come out here. We brought him out here. So it's really not fair that he should get killed out here with 
with somebody going down in an aircraft. So uh, we decided we would send him back to uh, Dong Batin, and he could ride out the war there. And he did, his foot healed up, and, and he rode out the war in Dong Batin. We had another animal there, and this was him. <laughs> his name is Bob Harrington, and he, he and I graduated together. He was right behind me. And he originally was a slick pilot, and after we lost some pilots in the gun platoon, he volunteered to come down and fly guns with us. And normally, when you have uh, a team of guns, if you've got two gunships, it's a light team. If you've got three or more, it's a heavy, heavy gun team. So we normally flew with just two gun teams. We called ourselves the heaviest light gun team in Vietnam because we all weighed over 200 pounds. But before he came into the gun pilot, or became a gun pilot, he was involved in an operation on the Bami Tuat, just to the uh, southwest of Bami Tuat. And the job that they had was to put these young gentlemen out there, LERPs, Long Range Reconnaissance Patrol. Now, believe it or not, this is before they went out when they were clean. And usually they went out as a team of six, and they get on the helicopter and they take them out and drop them off, usually about sunset or somewhere along there. And we usually go in and they'd faint to about four or five different LZs because people were watching us. And they didn't, we didn't want them to know exactly where we dropped these guys off. So they go into one, then the other, and they bounce around. And at one of those places, these six guys would get out and they'd melt into the woods. So we went out there covering the insertion and somewhere along the line, they got out, ran into the trees, and that was the last we saw them. And by the time it was, we dropped them off, it was getting dark. So we said, okay, well, what's next? Well, we want out of here. I said, you know, how about if we just call out some gunships and we keep our guys on target all night? No, we want out. Okay. So we call back, to, and out comes Harrington. Here comes the bear. He's got him and another aircraft coming out. And they're going to pick these guys up on a rope. They can't land, so they've got to go pick them up on a rope. So what they do is he's get, he gets down there by the trees, and he's got to turn on all his lights. He's got a searchlight. He's got a landing light. He's got all the lights on so he can see what's going on. And they drop a couple lines down, and each aircraft takes out three. Bear picks up three, and the second aircraft picks up three. Now, these guys are hanging under the aircraft. You can't pull them up in there. So we figure they don't want to ride all the way back to Bowlock hanging underneath the aircraft at night. That's just a little bit nudge. Well, we happen to know that there was a runway that wasn't being used. So we found that, and we all landed out there. We had the slicks, the guns, and all these guys, this team we just picked up. We had a little survival party. Everybody's hooping and hollering and saying, whoa, this was great. And I said, I need to talk to that radio operator. And I said, so uh, what exactly was it you saw down there? And he said, well, you know, the first two runs with the helicopter, he said, those rockets were way too far out. He said, but the third con, man, he came in, and he said, I was watching you come in, and all of a sudden, all the bullets in the world were coming right at us. He said, they started out about 100 yards, and they were coming right up to us. They stopped and went down this side. And he said, all the way down, I could hear him hitting people. He said, they were, they were hitting people. And he said, I looked back and here comes two rockets. And he said, I finally got my voice and yelled, cease fire. And he said, the rockets went right over our head and learned it about, landed about 10 meters behind us. He said, that was great shooting. I didn't have the heart to tell him. I said, you guys are the luckiest bastards in the world. <laughs> we had nothing to do with that. I said, I think Joe Baggett is blind as a, as a bat. But at any rate, he swears that uh, it, it, it got him out of there alive. We had a little rivalry that he always had with the, uh, with the guns and the slicks. One of our favorite fa phrases was, ah, slicks are for kids. <coughs> so we were working on a deal on, on Duck Lab. This is the border, so it was a pretty tense place. And we'd gone out there with six helicopters, six uh, slicks and two gunships, and we were going to support this operation. Well, the ground commander came up after a while and he said, we're waiting for some other equipment to get in here, and we're not going to be ready to go for three hours. So if you guys want to fly back to Bama to it and get some lunch, you can do that, because we'll probably be running late tonight. Well, our crew chiefs on the gunship said, you know what, it's really a pain in the butt 
to have to fly these things in. We got to get fuel in there. We got to come back out here. We got another fuel out of a out of a barrel that they got to pump. He said it's just a lot of work. Why don't you guys fly on the slicks and go in and get some lunch and bring some out for us? Okay, if you guys want to stay here on guard, we'll do that. So they stood by the aircraft. And we hopped on board the slicks. Well, the slick drivers thought they'd show these dumb gunnies how to fly close formation. So they're starting to get closer and closer. And I noticed about the time that the crew chief on our aircraft picked up his feet to keep the rotor blades from getting them. I said, this is getting a little silly. These guys are showing off a little bit too much. So I leaned over to the guys in the aircraft with me and I said, when you hear the noise, I want you to look outside and point. Okay. So these guys are getting in tight and they're feeling real good about how good they're flying. And I took out my 38 pistol and I just went down and rapped on the floor with it. Bam, bam, bam. And it sounds just like gunfire, like a receiving ground fire. And of course, as soon as that happened, the pilot snaps his head around and he's looking at us, whirling, pointing at the ground. And I can see his lips move, ground fire. <laughs> And all of a sudden, these six helicopters are all over the sky, man. Everybody's doing a bandit break and heading for home. So we finally get into to, uh, baby to it. We hop out to go have lunch. And these guys are all inspecting the aircraft for bullet holes. It ain't working for them, but it worked for us. So we finally get back out. And we fly back out to, uh, to Duck Lap. And Dick Snow was the pilot we were flying with. And as we get out of the aircraft, he's shutting it down, still running. And I leaned up. I said, hey, Dickie. He looked back and I took my pistol out and I wrapped it on the floor. Bam, bam, bam. I said, yeah, it sounds just like ground fire, doesn't it? Well, it's a good thing we had our own helicopters out there. We weren't gonna get a ride on those guys anymore. Well, as they say, payback is a bitch. So uh, my good buddy, Jim Broderick, who was sometimes in the guns and sometimes in the lift platoon, was flying slicks that, that, that month. He says, come in, he said, hey, you wanna go on a slick mission with me? I said, oh. Me flying a slick? No, I don't think I can do that. Come on, you'll love it. I'll let you fly. I said, okay. So we get in the aircraft. I'm in the left seat. And he says, go ahead and pick it up to hover. Hover? Hmm. You know, we won't. Our gunships don't hover. So I picked it up, and it was hovering. And you could do pedal turns. All the stuff that helicopters are supposed to do. We made it take off. The RPM warning light didn't come on. It was great. And it got better, because as we got, took off, we started climbing up. We never climbed up in gunships. We were always down in the trees. So we're climbing up, and I can actually see, for the first time, the South China Sea. So this is cool. Better than that, we get above the mountains. I've never been above the mountains in Vietnam. And then the other thing that's amazing is it gets cooler as you go up. It was great, too, because we flew above the clouds. What a concept. Guns never flew above the clouds. We were struggling around underneath them. So I'm out there flying around saying, this is really neat. Jim took the controls. He said, okay, we're going about, we're getting ready to go into the LZ. I'll take it. So he calls them up and he said, pop smoke. We identify where they're going. I'm going, that's the landing zone? Well, sort of. So, oh, sort of. So as we're coming in, it's starting to get nasty clouds, and there's not a lot of places to go. This is just on the side of a mountain. And I'm looking out there going, Jim, you, you can't land in that. He said, well, we're not exactly going to land. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put the nose of the helicopter on the side of the hill and hold it there. Really? Yeah. Watch. So he's got the nose of the helicopter stuck up against the side of the hill. And you got to remember from here on up, it goes uphill, so the distance between the rotor blade and the ground is only about three feet. And my eyes are about that big around watching all this nonsense. I'm going, oh, this is bad. I don't like this. And meanwhile, all these people are getting off and supplies and equipment are being dropped off. And it's constantly changing the CG, the weight of the aircraft is constantly changing. And he's got to balance this thing up there. And I'm thinking to myself, this is not fun. No way is this fun. And I look up and uh-oh, guess what? Here come the clouds. And I didn't want to disturb them because I figured, I don't want to say anything quickly. I just want them to concentrate. And I said, Jim? Yeah. I said, clouds are coming down. And he gave it a glance and didn't make much of it. 
And finally, the crew chief in the back says, okay, we're empty. He said, you need to move your tail to the left a little bit because we got a tree right behind us. And then you can go up. Go up? <laughs> go up where? There's a cloud here. Where the hell is this guy going? And I'm thinking, maybe I ought to unstrap and jump out of this lunatic asylum. This is crazy. No, he pulls it up. We go instantly IFR. Can't see a thing. I'm thinking, we are now dead. I'm still breathing, but we are dead. And what he did is he spun the aircraft around and drove, dove down the side of the mountain back up. So we kind of popped out through the bottom of the clouds. Maybe, oh, about 240 on the heartbeat. He climbs back up through it and gets on top. He says, you want to fly? No, no. I don't think I do. You got a bathroom on this thing? <laughs> I'd like to uh, close out with Murph the Surf because it sort of combines everything I've been trying to talk about tonight. Uh, Don Murphy was the uh, one of our slick drivers, and, and his favorite place to be was at the back end of a, of a formation. And we called him Murph the Surf. And his call was, when he got up, the surf's up. And what that told us lead is that the entire flight was up, it's formed, and we're heading out. So when you heard surf's up, that means that flight was moving. But on this day, he wasn't flying with the group. The, we also supported this MACV Recondo School, which, up in, which was up in the train, training with a six-man team, got dropped into a known enemy location, and their job was to recon that enemy for about a week, and then they'd come out and report what was going on. So the, uh, the job that we had, not we, but the, the company had, was to drop these guys off into the known position so they picked him up in the train and the helicopter flew him out and they figured out where they wanted to go. He we went in and dropped him off. And as soon as he dropped him off, the helicopter started a receiver fire. And he took 34 hits before he could even turn out. So he started calling for help right away. We just happened to be in the area with the two gunships and we started responding to these guys. And they had dropped into a real known position, all right. They said they had about a company size element chasing them. So we got these six guys running through the woods, and they started throwing smoke grenades over their back as they're running, so maybe we can identify their position. But they're in triple canopy jungle. So by the time the smoke wanders its way up through the trees and finally gets out to the top, it's pretty widely dispersed. You really can't tell. We put some minigun fire in there to see if we can do some good, but it wasn't working. So about that time, Don Murphy shows up, single ship, helicopter. He said, what's up? Gave him, gave him a scoop. He said, okay, I'll get these guys out of here. I said, well, first you gotta find them. So he goes down and he hovers down on top of the trees. Now there's a bunch of bad guys down there with automatic weapons and he's sitting there as a sitting target, just hovering around trying to find these six guys and they're moving at the same time. He finally locates them on the ground. He can't see them, but he can. he's right above them. And he says, okay, you've got a Decent LZ about one kilometer ahead. And the guy on the radio says, <laughs> we're done, we can't make it, we're done. Murphy says, okay, turn right, 50 meters, I'll pick you up. Well, I was right behind him when he said that. So I looked to the right, yeah, I don't see any place to land. There's a place where the trees are a little bit less, and so I'm thinking, oh, no, you're not gonna do that. Yeah, he did. He went down there and cut the LZ with the rotor blades. He just went down there and twigs and stuff were flying all over the place. And I mean, it's nasty. I'm thinking, eh, this isn't good. But he gets it on the ground and these guys finally break into the clearing. Now the crew chief, wanting to help, gets out of his bay and he's standing in there and he's gonna help you. He's gonna throw these guys on back of the aircraft. So he's reaching down, pulling them up as they come up to the aircraft. He grabs them by their, by their straps and throws them on. The last guy on the team, the big bruiser, weighs about 240, and he's got an M79 grenade launcher. And his whole job during this whole run is to turn around and fire grenades every couple minutes, trying to keep everybody from catching up to him. He's the last guy. And as he comes up to the aircraft, he turns around so he, the crew chief can grab his shoulder harnesses. And just as he does that, the lead enemy soldier comes into the clearing. He's still got one grenade left in his M79, so he goes to shoot 
And three things, or two things happened simultaneously. The crew chief pulled and Murphy yanked pitch. So the helicopter left the ground and the crew chief yanked him up. The end result was the gun goes down and he fires a grenade and it goes off underneath the helicopter. Well, I didn't know what was going on. I was sitting up there flying around coming in on him. And all I could see was this huge cloud of white stuff flying around the aircraft. And I said, oh Lord, they've been hitting the fuel. And now we got jet fuel swirling around and it's gonna find that hot engine and this whole place is gonna go up and fire any second. And Murphy comes on the radio and he says, gas! I'm thinking, yeah, jet fuel. Tear gas! Tear, tear gas? I can't see. Well, the last grenade the guy had was a tear gas grenade. So when it went off, he filled the LZ full of tear gas. Well, Murphy's coming out and he can't see anything. I just happened to be right behind him. I said, oh, keep, keep coming. You're doing all right. Hold, hold the nose up. A little to the right, a little to the left. So I'm talking him out of there and I started to panic because I figured we got to do this all the way back home. We're going to lose something. This is not going to work. But fortunately, it was about 15 seconds and his eyes cleared. It seemed like about an hour and a half. But it took about 15 seconds for him to clear up. And finally he says, okay, I think I got it now. <laughs> That's good. I don't think I could talk you all the way back to Don Within. And he said, but the aircraft's shaking a little bit. I said, yeah, you probably ought to. You just cut down half the woods in South Vietnam, it ought to shake. He said, why don't you guys stay pretty close? So we don't normally fly formation, but I got on one side, the other guy got on the other side. We did what was kind of like a helicopter mutual hug. You know, we all got together and flew back to, to Don Within. And Murphy flew the aircraft directly into maintenance. He got out, got into another helicopter. The six guys got off. They flew up to Don to Natrang. Probably went back out in the field to finish their problem. We refueled and rearmed. Went back off to the afternoon. It was just a morning's activity, pretty typical of Vietnam. We put six guys in, pulled six guys out. Nobody got hurt. Nobody got killed. As far as I know, we didn't even hit any enemy down there. But it was a pretty terrifying day. I got some awards and decorations over there, and people say, well, you must, have, you must remember this event pretty well. And I said, you know what? What I remember was this event and the fact that this stuff was going on every day. We got medals because somebody was there to report that particular event. It impressed them at the time, and they wrote us up, and we got a medal for it. But stuff like this was going on every day. People were landing on mountaintops, and guys were picking up troops and cutting down trees with helicopters and doing all this stuff. And nobody ever got medals for that. It just worked out that way. My last day was October 28, 1968. There was an unwritten rule that the last two weeks you were in country, he kind of didn't have to fly anymore. That uh, didn't work out. It seems like uh, this mountain that existed between the Trang and Dong Tin had been a hot place for VC for many, many years. We just sort of ignored it, flew by. They didn't shoot at us. We tried to keep them out of it as long as everybody was content with the status quo. But they got some intelligence that they were starting to rearm. They were starting to bring up caches of weapons and it looks like they were going to initiate an attack down to us or up in the train. So the, we had Korean forces in the area, and they decided they were going to go up there and clean house. Now, the Koreans were very fierce fighters, and we knew it, and the BC knew it. And their general plan of operation was to circle the area that they were going to go into and start moving in and close the gap, and everything inside that circle died. Trees, people, animals, if it was alive when they got there, it was dead when they left. And these guys who were defending the place, they knew it. So it was a fierce, fierce fight. It's not a battle that you ever heard on TV, but these guys were desperate. So we spent the last couple of days in close contact, and on the 28th was the day before I was supposed to leave. And it was like, man, I'll tell you what, this is getting a little close. A lot of firefighting going on. And I started some fires right up here. And I got done that day and I said, that's it, time to go home. And we got that word that night, said, yeah, we got a word that Don Martin's gonna get hit tonight too. I said, see ya, packed my bag, went over to Cameron Bay, cause that's where the Freedom Bird was flying out. 
they didn't have room for me at the officers' uh, met, uh, the officers' uh, quarters, so I stayed in the officers' club all night. Drank myself till morning. Water, tea. <laughs> but I was a little concerned because you can see these runways take off in this direction over the South China Sea, and when we took off in the airplane, I was sitting on the left side and I could see the fires that I had started the night before. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, they've got some weapons up there that could reach out and hit this airplane. And somewhere along the line, about six months into the tour, you got the idea that you weren't going to come out of this alive. So it was sort of a surprise to be on the airplane to begin with. But it suddenly dawned on me, said, this is how they're going to get me. This is it. I'm going to be on the Freedom Bird, and they're going to blow us out of the sky into the South China Sea. And we took off, and I'm thinking, yeah, this is it, waiting for the rocket. And the aircraft banked out to the, to the uh, east and started heading back home. I said, huh, I might have made it. So how did everything turn out? Well, when we left, we had bands playing, flags waving, people waving and shape, saying hi and all this other stuff. When we got back, we came into Seattle-Tacoma Airport. We landed and I got off the plane and there was people along the fence and they were waving too and they had banners. But when I got over there, they weren't real happy with us. And there was people waving signs and saying really nasty things. Something about killing babies and all this other stuff. And there was a woman who looked not too much unlike my mother who was standing at the fence and she was spitting through the fence. I'm going, I kept looking around saying, what are they mad at? And I kept looking behind me, so somebody out here really pissed them off. And I realized they were mad at me. And it didn't make me angry, but it was depressing. It was depressing because it suddenly dawned on me that I just left a bunch of guys behind who were dead. And we're coming back and this is what we're facing. But fortunately, we had a chaplain over there who gave us some good advice. And you don't have the luxury of being depressed. Get with it. Get your act together. We traveled and went on to other wonderful things. The, uh, the aircraft that I flew a lot was called the Sidekick. It was our kind of our unit crest. And uh, the guy who manned it was, was Steve Zaleski, and that was the Sidekick. And it seemed like a lot of the things that happened to me over there happened when I was flying that aircraft. So I was glad to find out that the sidekick survived. And actually, uh, in honor of the duty that it did in Vietnam, found a place at Fort Stewart, where it's uh, still on, on uh, display today. 13,853,027 falsely claimed to have served in Vietnam. Gee. Supposedly the most unpopular war in a decade. I said, well, it wasn't unpopular for a lot of people because they thought they could cash in on it. We lost a lot of helicopter pilots over there. Most of the records will probably indicate that there was enemy action. The truth is that at least half those accidents were that accidents were due to pilot error, fooling around, doing something they shouldn't have been doing. And that's sort of what prodded me into the safety business. So I've seen a lot of guys die unnecessarily. I mean, nobody should die necessarily, but really, just due to foolish things, we had one crew crash and die because they were hauling beer. Said, That's no reason to die in Vietnam because you're carrying beer. I mean, getting shot down was easy, but you didn't want to die carrying beer. I appreciate your attention tonight. Congratulations on 50 years. And have a nice anniversary. Thank you very much.